You have a Bible, you know where to go by now, Hebrews. We're in chapter 9 today, and we're going to cover the first 14 verses. Now, I realize that after a month of Sundays talking about the high priestly work of Jesus Christ, and now we're bridging into the new covenant that he mediates, I realize that this is repetitious. And I feel the need to point that out. Because there's something in us that wants to move on, but the Holy Spirit isn't ready. When he was inspiring these words, these details were incredibly important to those Jewish believers reading this in the first century. They could not yet move on because their understanding of the covenant and the better nature of their high priest who mediates that covenant had everything to do with who they were as his people, as his redeemed people. And so I would say the same thing to us. We cannot become weary with the details. Some things take time and they they require an immense amount of detail for our understanding and the same is true here. And I've said this often, I need to say it again, when God repeats himself in the scriptures, what are we supposed to do? Do we gloss over that? And and just skip ahead because we've heard it before? Or do we pay attention? We pay attention. When God repeats himself in the scriptures, when he provides this amount of information, when his revelation is this thorough, then we must pay attention. Amen? So don't become dull of hearing. We can't afford to do that. All right? We've got to move from milky matters to the meat, and we we can't afford to become dull of hearing here. And I realize, too, with all this repetition, culturally, we may be scratching our heads, wondering, like, what this has to do with our standing in Jesus Christ, and all this talk about covenants and, and priesthood. Here's what we cannot do, okay? We can't shrug our shoulders and say, well, it's all gonna come out in the wash. We don't have that luxury. We can't act like it doesn't matter. It matters more than we know. Our position in Christ hinges upon, number one, his ministry as our high priest and the covenant that he mediates to us by faith. Like Our standing in him right now isn't just because we prayed some prayer in Bible school 30 years ago and were baptized. Our standing in Christ has to do with the covenant that he mediates and his better work as our high priest. Amen? And so this matters more than we know. And by the way, our understanding of that covenant standing the test of time and our place in that covenant standing the test of time is because of Jesus Christ, our better high priest, and because of the better nature of this covenant over the old. Now, last week, I gave you two reasons from chapter eight why this covenant was better, and we defined covenants. Do you remember what covenants are? Covenants are agreements. They're the means through which God relates to and deals with his people. God always relates to people in terms of covenants, always. And so, I gave you two reasons why the new covenant mediated by our better high priest is superior to the old. First, it's real as opposed to a pattern. Everything about the old covenant was a pattern. It was a copy and a shadow. It prefigured what was coming when the real came and we have the real in Jesus Christ. Amen? Second, it is complete as opposed to that which is no longer valid. It's perfect. And we're gonna talk more about that today. And so this argument here in chapter nine continues. And and it continues with comparison. The old is contrasted with the new. We have the old versus the new, all in an effort to prove that the new is better. It is superior in every way. Now, we're familiar with this line of comparison. We do it all the time. You did it this week, and you probably didn't even think about it because it's natural to you to compare things like this. When you go to the grocery store and you're comparing products, you're not just looking at price 
But if you're like me, you're reading ingredients. Anybody else do that? Why are we doing that? Yeah, we want to see what's inside. We want to know what we're buying. We're not just looking at price, but we want to know what we're getting into, right? And we do that when we're buying shoes, and we do that when we're buying a car, and we, we do that in every area of our life. We do that when we're shopping for cell phones or, or particular services like that. We, we line things up, and we compare them in detail because we want to know what we're getting into. We want the best bang for our buck, right? Have any of you bought anything on Amazon lately? You're laughing because everybody buys stuff on Amazon. Sometimes I wish we could go back to not buying things on Amazon. But, you know, I interesting thing that Amazon has started doing here recently, and I don't know when it started, but I just noticed it this week. They started comparing things for you. So if you do a search on Amazon, and let's say you're looking for a watch, you're going to click on that, and it's going to bring it up, and then if you scroll down far enough, it's going to have half a dozen other options for you where it might be from the same company, and it might not be from the same company, but they're gonna, they're gonna highlight not just price, but the specs of each one of those things, whether it's a computer or a watch or a pair of shoes, and, and, and it's gonna highlight all of those different things for you so that you can look at that in one picture graph and make an informed decision on what to buy. What's best for you, you get the best bang for your buck. Now, the Holy Spirit isn't taking us shopping here, okay? We're not shopping for high priests, and we're not shopping for better covenants. He simply is using the same mechanism, a clever line of reasoning contrasting the old with the new, and they're lined up for us so that we can see them side by side in that comparison. And it's not pitting the old against the new. It's simply comparing them so that we can understand the superior nature of the new as it is mediated by our better high priest. And so let's turn our attention now to the scriptures. If you're in Hebrews chapter 9, we're going to read the first 14 verses in the chapter. Read along with me. These verses are going to be on the screen as well. Scripture says, Now even the first covenant had regulations for worship and an earthly place of holiness. For a tent was prepared, the first section in which were the lampstand and the table and the bread of the presence. It is called the holy place. Right now, we begin to see that the Holy Spirit is taking us on a tour of the tabernacle. Those plans given to Moses on Mount Sinai, constructed by the people of Israel in the desert, that was their place of worship. God regulated that place of worship, that tent of the meeting. Behind the second curtain was a second section called the Most Holy Place, having the golden altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant, covered on all sides with gold, in which was a golden urn holding manna, an Aaron staff that budded, and the tablets of the covenant. Above it were the cherubim of glory, overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these things we cannot now speak in detail. Meaning that there's so much there that we don't have the time to cover it. These preparations having thus been made, the priests go regularly into the first section, performing their ritual duties, but into the second Only the high priest goes, and he but once a year, and not without taking blood, which he offers for himself and for the unintentional sins of the people. By this, the Holy Spirit indicates that the way into the holy places is not yet opened as long as the first section is still standing, which, according to the Holy Spirit, is symbolic for this present age. And according to this agreement, this covenant, all of these regulations and preparations that were given Under the first arrangement, gifts and sacrifices are offered that cannot perfect the conscience of the worshiper, but deal only with food and drink and various washings, regulations for the body imposed until the time of reformation. But when Christ appeared as high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent not made with hands, that is not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places, the very presence of God, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, Purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living 
God. We see, amen, yeah, we see the comparison, do we not? And by the way, this comparison continues in greater detail through the end of the chapter into chapter 10. More on that in the weeks to come. For now, let's dig into this comparison, shall we? But first, let's ask God's blessings upon his word. Father, send your word to do the very thing that you've purposed it to do. And I pray this morning that you would deepen our understanding and our appreciation of our high priest and the covenant that he mediates. It is superior in every way. And God, we thank you for that. We thank you that the covenant stands because Christ Jesus is seated at your right hand. We thank you that our place in that covenant stands because it has been sealed by his blood and thus he purchased for us an eternal redemption. God, we praise you for that. So as our understanding and our appreciation is deepened, we pray that you would increase our faith and that our love for you would grow down deeply into the soul of our being. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So let's dig in here. Let's talk about the comparison. And let's just see in our mind's eye, a tablet, chart, if you will, and we have on one side the old covenant and we have on the other side the new. And so when we start talking about the Old Covenant, first of all, we realize verses 1 through 10 talk about its limitations. The Old Covenant, number one, is limited. Now let's dig in here, because as we're taking on this tour of the tabernacle where we see priests under the Old Covenant ministering their ritual duties in the tabernacle that was patterned after heaven itself, all of those regulations, all of those preparations that were made, Throughout the books of Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and again in Deuteronomy, we have the the retelling of these things. All of those things required for their place of worship and for those duties of worship were all part of that agreement that God made with the people of Israel. All of that had been sealed in blood through sacrifice. They entered into that agreement with God mediated by Moses. Now, in, in, I'm reading through the Bible through chronologically this year, and I just finished Numbers this morning, and it, it is striking to me, having read through that in parallel to this conversation we're having in Hebrews, how precise those regulations were. They, they were exact, right? And they were very strict to the point that it would be better for them not to do something out of neglect than to do it and to do it wrong. If they did something wrong, just ask Aaron's sons who offered strange fire before the Lord. If they did something wrong, they were liable to die. And so they were strict and they were exact. That, that Those standards were incredibly high. And in the books of Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy, there is an immense amount of detail. And we were remarking this morning in Sunday school My men's class began to study through Exodus and how scant sometimes the details are. For instance, we have just two chapters at the beginning of Genesis that cover creation. Now, I don't know if you're like me, but I'd like to know a little bit more about that. How about you? We're simply told that God spoke and things that did not exist were made at the power of his word, and then God blessed what he had made, and and we have this seven-day saga that takes up two chapters in which God creates everything in the universe. But then when we come to the tabernacle in the book of Exodus, we have 16 chapters that describe its construction and its dimensions and the articles for sacrifices, and we're not, we haven't even gotten into the sacrifices yet. We're just talking about the tent itself, 16 chapters as compared to two. And that's just an exodus. There's more in the other books that Moses wrote about that. And so we have an immense amount of detail, and what does that tell us? Except we come away with the understanding that God wanted things done a specific way when it came to worshiping him, and that nothing less would do, right? That's the standard. God sets it. It's exact. It's strict, full of detail, and nothing less 
than obedience would do. And so in this short tour of the tabernacle in verses one through 10, we find the limitations of the old covenant enumerated for us. And first we see under the old covenant, ministry was limited. That it was, it was limited, and this, this is summarized in verse 10 for us when it talks about the need for that old covenant to be reformed. It required reformation. Now that word, reformation, means to correct or to amend. Literally, it means to straighten out something that's crooked. And that's not implying that the nature of the old law was crooked. It means that it needed to be finished. It needed to be completed. There was a time of reformation required. And we have to ask ourselves something. To the writer's point here and to the Holy Spirit's point, why did those things need to be reformed? Why did they require reformation? Why did it require an amendment or correction? Or why did it need to be straightened out? Because, dear ones, it was limited. Not just in the sense of being temporary, but that God had in mind from the very beginning that that would be a temporary covenant, that it soon would come to an end and God would inaugurate a new order under Jesus Christ. Strict as it was, the old covenant had a limited reach. It was ceremonial. It was external. So it was very limited in what it could accomplish, meaning that it never passed skin deep, that it never transformed the heart. It never granted liberty to the spirit. It never renewed the mind. And th- there's a sense here, too, that it's, it's not just limited in what it was able to accomplish, but also there are spatial limitations to it. And when you start looking at the tabernacle and all that was required and all the preparations and all the regulations, you find very quickly that worship was limited to one place and that it had to be done by specific people in that specific place, right? And so that leads me to see some parallels to our attitude about church over the years. You know, for for generations in our culture, we have limited worship to an hour or two on Sundays. And that, that it's at a specific place and it's conducted by specific people. That's very Old Testament regulation, right? You understand? And, and so you see it's limited here. It's compartmentalized to the place that was prepared and all of those regulations that ordered it and the particular people that were ordained to do it And that that puts us on a path to understand how limited the ministry of the Old Covenant was. Secondly, ministry was limited because access was limited. And along with those spatial requirements, it also meant that sacrificing in that act of worship, presenting an offering before the Lord, those ritual duties that were performed were limited to the priests. And even those priests were limited. That there was really only one person out of an entire nation of people that had access into God's presence. And that one person had access to God's presence one time a year. And at best, there were two entrances. First for himself and then for the sins of the people. And so access, loved ones, was limited. And all of that access, by the way, was limited by the regulations that God set up for their worship. All of those preparations and regulations under the old covenant limited by design people's access to God. And that means something, that under the old covenant, the Holy Spirit indicates that God is off limits. That everything we see about the Old Covenant, even the way that it is brought to pass, that that the nation of Israel gathers around Mount Sinai and boundaries are set up so that the people don't break through and God doesn't break out amongst the people and kill them. Meaning that they're not prepared to receive his glory and the same thing is true in the tabernacle to everyone, even at, at most times, except for on the Day of Atonement, God's presence was off limits. And, and that, by the way, is a dreadful circumstance, isn't it? That you can worship God, but you need to stay back. That, that God created you to enjoy him and to worship him and to love him, but 
you cannot come into his presence. And so when we start thinking about things and our relationship to God and we start allowing the, the spirit of the age, we start allowing the hot breath of hell to tell us that we're unworthy to come into the presence of God, it's very Old Testament, it's very Old Covenant. Where access was limited. Or because God was holy, we had to stay away. And in our sin, that is certainly true. But in our great high priest, it is not. Amen? And we'll talk more about that in a moment. Now, because access was limited, sacrifices were limited. That those sacrifices that were so well-ordered and so strict and so specifically given in the law were limited to the same degree that ministry was limited and access was limited, all by regulation. And those limitations were felt. They felt them every time they made offering to the Lord. Every time, uh, if you were a, a person in Israel, every time you brought a lamb or a goat or a, a, tur a pair of turtle doves or two pigeons, every time you brought your grain offerings or your drink offerings to the Lord, that it was a constant reminder that these things were only skin deep that they concerned food and drink and various washings, that they were external regulations for the body, cleansing that external moral filth away, but it never dealt with the heart. And that means something. And in all of those strict regulations, that even the most exact expression of them were never more than a symbol. They were never more than a symbol. And the fact that they had to be repeated day in and day out, week in and week out, year after year after year was a parable in and of itself, teaching the worshiper how imperfect those sacrifices were, were. Even though it had to be the first fruits of their grain and the first fruits of their vineyards, and even though it had to be a lamb without spot or without blemish, those sacrifices were imperfect by nature, and they were a perpetual reminder of an unmet need. And that unmet need was cleansing. And so limited sacrifices produce limited cleansing. And this helps us summarize then the limited nature of the old covenant. That whatever cleansing was provided under all of those regulations and all of those preparations with all of that strictness and exactness prescribed by the law, cleansing was limited. According to that arrangement, all of those ministerial duties of the high priest, they could never cleanse the conscience of the worshiper. We see that very clearly in verse nine. It never did anything about guilt. I'm, I'm talking about actual spiritual guilt that we feel, that we know in our heart. It never did anything about that. And there was no freedom from it because guilt was never completely removed. And I know we talked about that last week, so I don't wanna belabor the point but, but all of that was moral and external, and those worshipers enjoyed it temporarily. They never had a lasting, abiding sense of peace with God through their sacrifice. They knew that their sin offering was only as good until the next time they sinned. They knew that the offering the priest offered for the unintentional sins of the people on the day of the atonement, that one time he could go in on their behalf into the very presence of God was only good for a year. It had to be done again the following year and that they themselves would have to bring all of their offerings day after day, week after week, year after year as a perpetual reminder of an unmet need. And so those limited sacrifices produced limited cleansing and it was only as good until the next sacrifice. Now, a couple of things before we move on and we begin to line up the new covenant alongside the old. This compare and contrast mechanism here that the Holy Spirit is, is employing, that it, it fits hand in glove with the deep sense of concern that our writer has for his Hebrew readers. Those people who are saved out of Judaism who may have been tempted to bring along with them some of their 
tenets of Judaism, those people who may have been on the fence, who had yet to commit to, although they agreed with, the merits of Christianity, they were, they were trying to figure out how maybe they could do both, or those people who outright rejected Christ altogether, didn't believe that he was the Messiah, this comparison fits hand in glove with the writer's deep sense of concern for those people. Because if they were considering a return to the tenets of Judaism, to do so meant the return of all of the limitations of the old covenant. And that, that, that means that they would return to a system that provided no real forgiveness for them. That any, any mercy that was offered through those sacrifices would have been temporary. And that all of those regulations only dealt with their body and the food that they ate and the beverages that they drank that it never dealt with the heart, it could never bring any real cleansing and therefore bring any real peace with God. It meant, too, the return of the fact that they had no access to God himself, that God was over there and that any worship to be conducted was done by a specific group of people who were also limited under a limited covenant. That would be a dreadful step backwards. Don't you agree? And so this comparison fits hand in glove with that. And by the way, it serves as a needful reminder for all of us if we are tempted to reinvigorate the dead works of worthless, worthless religion that is no help to anyone. That, that if we try to claim faith in Jesus Christ, hear me out, that we believe that we are saved by grace through faith in Jesus alone. Right? We agree about that. Do we not? Y'all with me? We agree about that. But after that, if we start to believe and hold on to the fact that we somehow are kept by our own righteousness, that, that we will somehow make it into heaven and enter into the joy of our Lord because we've managed to figure everything out and keep our nose clean, that we are reinvigorating the dead works of the law, and that is a return to the same limitations of the old covenant. Do you understand? That is a dreadful step backward. There's no freedom there. There's no lasting mercy there. There's no abiding sense of peace there. And so let's heed the warning. Amen? Now, we also must contrast the new. And so on this side, we have the old, and we've part and parcel laid out those limitations so that we know what we're looking at, right? So now we can do the same thing with the new. The, new, the old covenant is limited. The new covenant is perfect. And we see that in just a few short verses, verses 11 through 14. Now, I want you to think carefully, carefully with me about what we now know under the better covenant. So I want you to notice with me, glorify the superiority of our high priest, glorify the superiority of this new covenant that he mediates, Christ's ministry, unlike that of the old, which was limited, is itself perfect. His ministry is perfect. He is high priest of good things that have come. Not yet to come, but have come. And so the old covenant pictured and promised good things that were to come. All of those arrangements, all of that detail, all of those prescriptions were good things and they pictured better things to come. But there's a good deal of difference between good things pictured and promised and good things delivered. You understand? And in the new, those good things have been delivered. That's what makes it better. That's why Christ's ministry, his ministry to which all other high priests point, is perfect. It's not limited. It's perfect. Those good things have literally come to pass, have been birthed and come into being by Christ Jesus, our better high priest. Now, what are these good things? Just in case you're wondering. What are they? They are new covenant blessings of grace. We talked about this last week. Remember? Remember? From that quote from Jeremiah 31 through 34 and chapter 8, verses 8 through 12, they're parallel there. We're talking about a covenant of grace. It's not dependent upon merit. 
of the worshiper. It is grace. That is a new covenant blessing. We're talking about a covenant that is brought to pass through the work of the Holy Spirit. That, that this is a better way to worship in spirit and in truth. Not just external, not just washing the body, not just eating the right things and drinking the right things and making the right offerings in the right order at the right time, but worship in spirit and in truth. Right? A, a covenant that actually produces lasting mercy where forgiveness is real, it abides, and it brings peace with it. To borrow from Ephesians chapter 4, we are talking about, or chapter 2, excuse me, we are talking about rich mercy and great love from God. Because he, when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, made us alive together with Christ Jesus and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places so that in the coming ages he might show his immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ. We are talking about something that God in eons past in the counsel of his own will determined to do for everyone who believes. Everyone he calls to faith in Jesus Christ. Everyone he justifies by faith, he has raised up with Jesus Christ out of his rich mercy and his great love and seated us with Christ in the heavenly places. And so his ministry is perfect, you see. What, what Paul has in mind there is the same thing that we've been talking about in Hebrews for weeks now. We see Jesus, our great high priest, passing through the heavens and taking his seat at the right hand of the majesty on high, where God, according to his own will, has seated us there with him. His ministry, perfect. And perfect ministry then means perfect access. Christ has unlimited access. Unlike his Levitical counterparts, unlike all of those regulations that ordered old worship under the old covenant, Christ has unlimited access. We see this again in our scripture that, that he has entered through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is not of this creation. He entered once and for all into the holy places. Now, if you'll let me, let me make a couple of distinctions here, okay? The first has to do with where our high priest ministers. That, that where he ministers is the real thing. It is not man-made. We're talking about the very thing that God told Moses to build after a pattern of the real thing. That's where Christ ministers, that he ministers in the heavenly sanctuary in God's actual presence, not a manifest presence in the holy, most holy place where, where God would appear, his glory would appear between the cherubim atop the, the mercy seat. We're talking about the very real presence of God on his throne in heaven right now. That's the real thing, amen? Second has to do with his entry into that heavenly place. Simply put, we know this under the old covenant, the old high priest had very limited access. We've already talked about that, right? One day a year, at best, two entrances, one for himself, one for the sins of the people. He had to go in, do his work, and leave. He could not stay. There was no abiding presence of God there. All of that ordered by those regulations under the old covenant. Christ Jesus, however, has entered into that holy place and there he remains. He has entered that place once and for all. He doesn't have to go and offer his blood and come back out and sacrifice himself again and come back in and offer it again. It is once and for all. And having entered there, he remains ministering as our great high priest, ruling as our king in the same place 
at the right hand of the majesty on high. And as I've already pointed out, he doesn't go in there alone. He brings us with him. Under the old arrangement, you remember the Old Testament high priest, the old covenant high priest would go in for himself first and offer blood that was not his own. He would go in a second time and offer blood that was not his own for people that were not him, who could not come with him. But in the new covenant, it is better, loved ones, because Christ bids us come and welcome. We come with him. He brings us into God's presence, not just in death. We're not talking about something that transpires when when our soul leaves our body and our bodies are committed to the ground and our souls return to God who gave them. We're talking about something that we have right now. It is an abiding gift from God. Christ brings us with us, with him rather, into his presence. By the way, that's not something we just look forward to in the kingdom either. Not something we just look forward to when God makes all things new. It's something that we have right now. Thus we are told we have confidence to draw near. That that we have boldness even. The great expectation that when we come to God through Christ our great high priest, we will find welcome there. Because he brings us with him. He has Unlimited access, not just for himself, but for all who come to God through him. Amen? Also, we understand we're laying this out, right? We're talking about superior ministry and superior access. Now we understand that Christ offers superior sacrifices. He doesn't offer the blood of animals, bulls and goats and lambs. He doesn't burn something on the altar and then sprinkle the ashes to purify somebody from their sin. He has offered himself and through his own blood, he offers that superior sacrifice. We see that in verses 12 and 14. Now, it is impossible for us to overstate the importance of blood in the scriptures. If I were to take you on a journey going all the way back to Genesis chapter 3, when Adam and Eve fell, when they sinned and ate fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the very tree that God told them not to eat from, and their eyes were opened, and that they knew that they were naked, and they were separated from God and tried to hide themselves, themselves, blood was shed. God killed animals that he made and blessed and pronounced goodness, good, and took their skins and made clothes for Adam and Eve. Blood was shed. It's mentioned no less than nine times in our text. And we will soon learn later in the chapter from verse 22 that Without the shedding of blood, forgiveness is an impossibility. There is no forgiveness of sin without blood sacrifice. And so the offering of blood under the old covenant, under those old regulations, knew no end. Blood always had to be spilled. It went on day after day, week after week, month after month, Year after year, priests offered blood that was not their own. And it has been said that that on the, the Day of Atonement or on Passover, when people were bringing their lambs into the temple, that priests were so busy slaying lambs for the millions of worshipers that had come to Jerusalem on their pilgrimage for that holy festival that the mountain of the temple itself ran red with blood. That the kidron, instead of flowing clear, flowed red with blood. It knew no end. In contrast, however, the sacrifice that Jesus offers is his own blood. And his sacrifice was superior nature to the blood of countless animals. And it remains superior in its effect because it is precious blood. 1 Peter 1 and 19, that cleanses us from all sin. 
doesn't have to be done over and over and over again, 1 John 1 and 7. It is so superior, in fact, that it never needs to be repeated. Not only has Christ entered once and for all into the heavenly places, that his sacrifice was once and for all. And that's gonna come up several more times in our study, so just store that away, treasure that in your imagination. It is once and for all. So on account of that one fact right there, our superior high priest offering himself in a superior sacrifice to God for our cleansing, he is able to accomplish something that all the blood of every sacrifice under the old covenant could never accomplish. And that has to do with our cleansing, as I've already said. Christ's cleansing is complete. Look with me at verse 12. It is through his sacrifice, he secures for us an eternal redemption. You see that in verse 12? And then in verse 14, his sacrifice purifies the conscience of the worshiper from dead works to serve the living God. Those dead works, incidentally, happen to refer to all of those regulations under the old covenant that could do nothing to bring life. They only meant death, right? And so Christ's cleansing is complete. Now, the old covenant served its purpose. It was imperfect, we know that, but it was not without value. It provided moral cleansing, but that cleansing was external, and more importantly, it was a picture, as I've already said, of the worshiper's true need. They needed real cleansing. And so the new then, through the sacrifice of our better high priest under the new covenant, regulated by the spirit, not by the letter, far exceeds the old in its reach. Christ obtains permanent. That's what that word eternal means. It means permanent and unchanging, that our redemption is as immutable as our high priest who purchased it. Somebody say, praise God. That is an amazing fact. He purchased for us an eternal redemption. It is good now and for all time that it redeems us from past sins, present sins, and future sins. And through one act for all time, all of your sin debt and mine and every other believer for that fact has been paid, all of it. Not one bit of it remains. It has been forever purchased for with his blood. And we then are free indeed. Jesus promised that, right? Whoever the son sets free is free indeed. And so this redemption secures, this eternal redemption secures eternal freedom from sin. And that simply means something to us as we're looking for application and we bring this to a close. That means he cleanses from the inside out, not from the outside only. And praise God for that. Because inside, that's where the real problem is, right? You remember that argument Jesus was having with the Pharisees about washing their hands and the disciples had eaten and they hadn't washed their hands and thus they were considered, you know, unclean, what they had touched with their dirty hands went into their body and thus made them morally unclean. And Jesus said, listen, that's not the way it works. What what a person eats doesn't make them unclean, but what comes out of a person makes them unclean because the heart is the problem. From out of the heart proceeds such unrighteousness, cursings, blasphemies, lying, murder, hatred, adultery, all of that finds its source In the heart. Everything else, all of those old regulations dealt with external things and never did anything about the heart. But Jesus, through his better sacrifice, by means of that better covenant that he mediates, transforms the heart. That his cleansing is so powerful, in fact, that it actually regenerates a person. That, that practically meaning that that means they're given a new heart. That, that the heart of stone, that's the problem, 
is replaced with a heart of flesh, a new heart upon which, according to Jeremiah in the previous text, God will write his laws upon. Where the Holy Spirit, the very glory of God that used to dwell between cherubim on the mercy seat now dwells in here because we have a new heart. And that, that we are recreated after righteousness and true holiness. This is important, loved ones, because that means we're more than just cleaned up, old, broken down creatures. And I believe that if we understand the new covenant, the new agreement that God has made with us by faith, mediated by our better high priest, it's time for us to begin to think of ourselves this way. That if any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away, and all things have become new. That as new creations, regenerated by the Holy Spirit, born again into the kingdom of God, we can actually be transformed moment by moment from, from this glory to the glory of Jesus Christ. Yeah, I think that's worth it. That we can become like the one who redeems us. Hallelujah. And so all this talk about covenants and agreements and priestly duties, please hear me once again. Please don't become weary in the details. This means everything to you if you understand it. Your standing in the covenant, the covenant itself, depends upon the work of our high priest who is seated at the right hand of the majesty on high. So do not become dull of hearing. This is far too important for you. As a matter of fact, this is the best reason in the world that we have to hold fast to our confession of faith, to grab hold of the hope that is set before us and never let go. The best reason that you have is our high priest and his better covenant to persevere. You can keep on going. You know that? You can look whatever comes your way tomorrow or next week or next year because you have a high priest who mediates a better covenant on your behalf. And all of this stuff, all of this stuff will pass away. It will. But our high priest abides forever. And if we are in him, so will we. Amen? So let's run with all of our strength for our very lives and take hold of the promised hope and never let go. Father, help us to persevere in our faith, to hold on to Jesus because he has taken hold of us. Help us to understand how much better this covenant is, this agreement that you have made with us through your son by faith, something that he has purchased for us with his own blood, and that is eternal by nature that it is as immutable as your promise, that it is as unchanging as our high priest position at your right hand. God, I thank you for that. Increase our faith today. Give us the strength, Lord. Empower us to persevere in that faith, to grab hold of the hope that is set before us and never let go. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's